Hey everybody, so today I wanted to, uh, something I wanted to do here for a while, talk about my musical history, my, my vocal history, the ups and downs, uh, finding my voice, continuing to find my voice, recording, touring, all that stuff. If that's not your thing, um, I'm going to be putting up another lesson type video tomorrow about uh, volume and decibel levels of how loud certain things are and recording that uh, hopefully on the spot, screaming distortion, everything, and showing how loud it actually is. <clears throat> but anyway, for today, I'm going to be talking about um, my musical history and hopefully not getting too superfluous with the details, but um, helping to uh, tell you about my journey and um, how long it took for me to find certain things and to get good at certain things and all that kind of stuff. So if that interests you at all, I'm going to talk about it. All right, so where to begin? I mean, I'll, I'll begin with my musical history and what made me want to be a musician when I wanted to become a musician, etc. Um, at some point, probably around the age like six, uh, I wanted to play drums. I have no idea why. I don't know where any of this stuff came from because I don't have a musical family, nor do I have a family that's into music. Um, Mostly, they my parents grew up like listening to country music and stuff like that, and I listened to a lot of that when I was young too. Popular, Alan Jackson type shit like that, you know, like the the stuff of the times when I was growing up. I was born in eighty five. Anyway, um, when I was seven, I heard Michael Jackson, and that changed my little my little world and my little mind. Um, it was so his voice and the music was so powerful for my little seven year old self that. Uh, it just changed everything for me, and I knew I wanted to do some version of that, like singing. Um, I remember there was a video, so this is just a funny little side note, but Blockbuster, if you remember Blockbuster video, they used to have this thing where they would, like, some kind of cash grab thing, where they were trying to help uh, record video of your kid and ask them a laundry list of questions, and then give you this VHS tape the parents would pay for in case your kid got abducted. And then um, it would be like, Hi, my name's uh, 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 I like uh, toys and playing with Legos. And um, I remember specifically being asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was eight years old and I said a singer. And the guy was like, yeah, man, you like singing, huh? And I was like, yeah, I guess. And I'd never sang, ever. Uh, I sang a little bit in choir and stuff like that probably got made fun of, um, and then didn't do it again. Um, it's a very hard thing. Uh, I think especially sometimes when I was growing up for a boy to be like, I like singing and to be in choir and stuff. And, uh, you know, the second somebody says like, you sound like a girl, you're like, nope, not doing this anymore. But anyway, I knew somewhere in there that, that I wanted to do that. So, uh, either way, uh, not to, like I said, not to get into too many details, but I wanted to play drums. My family was not supportive of the musical ideas, um, my brother didn't play any music. Nobody played any music. My mother could sing, but, um, they just didn't have money. We didn't have money growing up and they didn't want to be like, you know, here you can play snare drum or you can play anything. They just talked me out of it. But I, uh, luckily enough got this stepfather when I was 11 years old, went out to a music store one day cause he thought he was a cool guy and he bought an entire drum set. I was there with him. Some part of me deep down was like, he's doing this for me. He wasn't. <laughs> It was totally for him. But uh, thankfully then, I lived in a house with a drum set. He fucking never played it, and I slowly taught myself. Um, I still didn't sing, and I didn't know how to do any of that, and I didn't have a supportive system around me that was catering to anything with that, so I didn't do it. But around age 14 or 15, got into a band. We could not find a singer. Try to find a good singer. You know, it's not a fucking easy thing to do. Um, so slowly... But surely, um, when we couldn't find a singer, our bass player could not sing. And every time he did, we were like, shut the fuck. It was just bad. Is it really that bad, guys? Yes. So I tried singing one day, and I got that all-important moment that most of us need, which was, oh, hey, you're pretty good. So th that validation meant everything. And then just that little bit of that validation opened the door of being like, is this okay to be able to do? And um, then I slowly started writing songs and started writing 
things and started singing uh, uh, different songs. I had no fucking idea what I'm doing, not the slightest clue of anything, but I could carry a tune and I could mimic people a little bit, stuff like that. Mostly my band when I was young, 14, 15, were playing Blink-182 songs. That was it. <laughs> and uh, surprisingly, you know, like that means that very difficult for the drummer and then kind of easy for other people, but uh, good songs and it was a lot of fun. And then we started writing our own songs. Uh, if you need any advice in terms of writing lyrics and stuff like that, I had no idea that I could do that either, but I did it in a funny way, found out that I could write poetry and then slowly tried to just write, you know, verse and, and chorus and stuff and have a flow. And I slowly learned how to figure that out too. So anyway, throughout that, uh, two, three years in a band, uh, you know, a high school band, at one point I found I really wanted to figure out how this distortional stuff worked. And um, somehow one day with one of my friends, we were listening to a Nickelback song. It was, so one day out to the bridge that overlooked the water. I would, um, it's called uh, King of Man or something like that. It was an old Nickelback tune. I slowly kind of started learning how to do this distortional thing with my voice. And it wasn't really very good. And, uh, and I had no idea what I was doing. I was probably about 16. But I started learning that kind of realm of like, okay, how to do different things with my voice. So we'll speed this up a little bit because I know I'm making this too lengthy. But um, I started trying to write songs with like that distortional thing in mind. And like it would be like a clean verse and then a distorted chorus. And, it, you know, it was, it was what it was. It wasn't that good. We didn't, nobody knew how to record we had fucking CD player things that would record on it. It was all bad, and we never figured it out. And um, then I went to college. I went to college for music or for art because um, I was not. And once again, I didn't have a support system or anything that was saying, you know, you're good at music, go do musical things. So I went to school for animation because that was my next best choice. Um, probably shouldn't have done that, but uh, that's what I did. And it was awful, and they taught us 3D animation, and it was fucking terrible. And then I worked for the government for a number of years. Um, music was there and I, it was all I ever cared about and it was all I ever wanted, but I had no idea by myself with a girlfriend, like how to do it by myself and how to make music by myself. And, uh, so I just kind of suffered and kind of kept, it, it actually even felt, it felt, um, like imposter syndrome to say I was a musician because I didn't have anything to show for myself. I knew that was what I cared about and I played drums and I played guitar and I sang and everything, but, and I wrote, but I didn't know how to have anything to show for it. And I would buy devices and instantly become frustrated and fucking send them back. And I just, I, it was really hard to try to figure out. Uh, lo and behold, I get into a house. Uh, me and my ex-wife had bought a house. I was about 21 or 22 years old. And I had a space in there where I could set up some like electronic drums and have a space that was I could call my own for music. And um, struggling with writing, struggling with trying to put my stuff together. And, I, and, and once again, I knew I could write all the stuff at the same time. But um, I finally went to a place called Guitar Center, asked like somebody, what the fuck do I need to be able to record? And some kind person told me exactly what I needed and kind of how to do it. And I got hooked up with... Um, you know, this device where I, an interface I could plug into, and I finally slowly started figuring it out. And remember, this is before the days of YouTube and shit where I could just look it up like, this problem happened, and then some guy's like, hey, everybody, welcome to Tyler's channel. Fucking the uh, That didn't exist. So it was just, I don't know how to do this. Fuck. And then you try to look up forums. Anyway, um, I was working at that point having many, many health problems. Many of you don't know that I suffer from quite a bit of health issues, uh, chronic pain, inflammation, a lot of different things. Um, throughout my entire 20s, I suffered with uh, uh, panic disorder and anxiety disorder because of my health issues. And um, it was a nightmare. My entire 20s was just a complete fucking nightmare. But um, I had this job where I drove an hour and a half to work and an hour and a half back. And it was fucking awful. And I would have panic attacks while driving and have to pull off the highway. Um, during that, I got laid off. I worked for a contract for six months and then I got laid off. Anybody who's ever gotten laid off and knows that they're going to get money and it's going to be okay um, probably knows that feeling of being like, cool, I can just fuck off and do whatever I want. 
and then slowly realizing over the course of, it took me about a week and a half of doing nothing to realize like, oh, I have no purpose and I hate my life and this is awful. So I knew at that point I needed to write and to finally do this. The government is essentially paying me to survive and it was not easy to find a job in my field. I was a 3D animator, modeler, and whatever. That's like New York City and California type shit. Um, so I just stayed uh, laid off and started writing and figuring out how to do this for real. I had a really important uh, friend come into my life and then exit my life. And I, I kept not making music and stuff because I thought somebody needed to be there. And I just needed that validation and that help. Somebody came in and gave me that validation and then fucked off. And it was it was awful and very traumatic. And then again, I knew if I'm getting paid by the government to sit here and live my life and I know how to record and, and all this stuff, it's absolutely just my fault if I don't do this. So I made my first album. Um, it was a full uh, length album. I recorded most of the stuff myself, but then I went to two different studios to have it mixed and it cost me like $8,000. There I started finding a little bit of a voice or figuring out some more of this stuff vocally. Um, I had found some other kind of distortional spaces, but once again, I hadn't looked up anything about singing. I just, I didn't even know that was really a thing. I just thought it was like, you just have your voice and you kind of figure this shit out. And I found a little bit of a distortion. I didn't know that it was from an unhealthy place, but uh, I used that and I used, you know, what I could throughout my first album. Uh, after that first album, nothing happened. <laughs> And uh, I still go back to some of those songs. Like I, it was pretty amazing what I was able to do by myself. But um, I, we we had moved. I still struggled with my health a lot, and we moved to Philadelphia. And uh, I tried to join a cover band. We had two rehearsals, and then people already started going off the rails, getting shitty about who's going to where and who has to drive and all that. But the drummer um, showed my YouTube videos. I started making YouTube videos and putting up stuff. Um, he showed that to a person named Doc Coyle. He was a band, from a band called God Forbid. And I didn't know who he was, and I didn't like metal music, and I'm still not a big fan of metal music. But he reached out and asked me if I would sing on some demos. So that was, again, another thing of validation. You're going to find that validation thing a lot through this, and that's kind of how I live my sensitive, highly sensitive um, life. Um, probably because of how I grew up or whatever. But anyway... Um, Again, speaking more about singing, I was always trying to sing in the car and learn how to do these things, and I was finding more stuff, and most of the time I would just try to mimic people, and that's the only way I was ever gaining any ground, but once I found like a distortional space, like that was fucking it, man. I wanted to have a distortional, gritty voice, and mostly it was because, and you'll find this probably with yourself as well, it helps to hide, to have something to hide behind. Because the vulnerability of just being you, it's similar to hearing your voice played back in a message or something. It's very hard to be like, oh God, that's what I sound like. So a lot of us want something to hide behind. <clears throat> All this kind of stuff. And uh, and I did too. And we'll find versions of it that are totally unhealthy because it's very difficult to find the right, correct versions and build an actual foundation. But um, I quickly learned that the way I was singing for this Doc Coyle project, Vegas Nerve and stuff, was not sustainable. And then I, I started having more people reach out. I've mentioned this a couple times. I had uh, the bass player and the drummer from Breaking Benjamin reach out about a project. Um, a guy from Seether, that band, reach out about a project. And I hooked up with some of these people and started writing and stuff, but like deep down I knew I was not that guy that could just be like, fuck it, I'll go on stage and do this. I knew my voice wasn't ready for that. Um, because when I would do these things, my voice would start to go downhill. Like three songs in, I was like, fuck. And I just knew there was a there was a piece missing. Like I physically couldn't do the stuff I was hearing people doing. And <clears throat> there's a lot, as I'll talk about, that happens when you start getting on stage and fucking doing this. Let alone what you can do in your car or a studio when you actually have to get on stage repeatedly and do it. Do it live. Uh, it's a f totally different thing. So... Anyway, when I started having that wash over me, like, oh, I actually can't do this. Oh, people think I sound like Chris Cornell, but like, I kind of can't do this live. I would play with a guy from Seether, wonderful person named Pat Callahan. And like, he liked my voice and stuff, but like, 
I knew I couldn't do the same shit. You know, we'd play like fell on black days acoustic and no. <laughs> so when I, I kept having that happen, I started having this feeling of like, okay, I actually need to figure out how to do this. And sadly, the information I was finding kind of showed me that everything I had built up to that point was not sustainable and not real and had to go. And I try to tell people this stuff all the time, but most people, some people have had more years invested and, and they just cannot let go of habits or they think that their habits are better than what they're learning or what some dickhead on YouTube is saying. But in my case, very much so, it wasn't going to translate. It wasn't going to carry over. So it was like hitting reset. And any voice that I thought I had, any kind of established sound I thought I had, not going to work. Um, so I found uh, these consistent YouTube tutorials. Back then, it was Brett Manning. Brett Manning, Brett Manning. Brett Manning was the shit. He knew about mixed voice. His student people that he taught, that online and everything, that was like the main thing that you could really find that was consistently good and consistently um, just good teachers, good lesson videos, not some dickhead like, hey man, we're gonna fucking scream today, and just stupid, terrible videos back then. So um, I went down that rabbit hole and bought Mastering Mix and Singing Success. I learned so much from those and just ate that shit up. I just, it was a certain version of learning for me that was completely tied to vocal uh, and, and like mimicry and all that stuff that is just buried in me. I, and I'll say this too. I grew up in a family that does voices. My mother and my father, my father especially. Comedic, goofy people. Nowadays, you can barely do any kind of a voice without somebody being like, I am so offended right now. My grandfather, he used to have an accent because he was missing one of his front teeth. And when you do that, you sound like him and you're a piece of shit and you should be canceled forever. So anyway, I grew up in a family that does that, still does. It's very enjoyable um, talking like other people and everything and, and making ourselves laugh. And, and, uh, and that's how we tell stories. You know, it's not that guy said to me and then he said this it's it's doing the inflections and having that thing so anyway come to find out the more i went down this rabbit hole the more i started eating up this information because it's actually a deep kind of seated uh, and um good god uh obsession it's an obsession that's in my brain uh, all the intricacies of how these things work so i started learning how to do these things for real some of the seether things and all that stuff fizzled out. I was asked to be on The Voice. I wasn't ready, and I didn't care for the the stupid make music into a contest, and it's worse than ever now, belittling people and saying, you got it and you don't got it, and all this stupid shit. I'm just not a fan of it. But I also, like I said, if I'm being honest, I was not ready. I could do things in recordings and get them right or whatever. But once again, when it came to doing it actually live, okay, here we go, um, I couldn't do it. I, or I would, it just wasn't the same. So moving forward, started learning about mixed voice, started learning about things for real, but it took a lot of time. I never had a vocal lesson, still have not had a vocal lesson. I couldn't afford it. But I learned so much from those courses and stuff and from the Brett Manning stuff that I was able to actually quit my job. I actually got laid off again from another job, thank God, and uh, started teaching at a school of rock. I started teaching younger people, and I was able to teach and really know more and more of my shit, and people loved me as a teacher, and they, they could tell I knew what I was talking about. And of course, you get better, and you learn things, but I, I could really tell that I knew some things that a lot of people didn't know, and I was slowly building a foundation. I was always still on the precipice of knowing kind of how to do something right and not, kind of something right and not. Again, I didn't have any information to fall back on or people to trust in or to I couldn't find people that could do what I wanted to do and if I could they cost way too much money to go to you know somebody like Zen of Screaming uh, Melissa Cross it's like at back then it was $385 an hour to go to her I didn't have that so uh, it was just me <clears throat> uh we did more Vegas Nerve stuff me and Doc Coyle put a band together and we were going to go on tour uh which was going to be very small but it was going to be like five shows in California and then later like five, six shows in New York, New Jersey, stuff like that. When we went on tour, I got to California. I think it was the second time I was ever there. I'm an introverted, shy person. Uh, 
I'm on the autistic spectrum, highly sensitive, didn't know that stuff at the time, but something like that was one of the most overwhelming, insane things I've ever had to try to put myself through. Um, and not to mention, you know, still having problems with anxiety and things like that. But okay, now you're going to take all those things you recorded, which are very difficult, all over the place, high, low, distorted screams, everything. And now you're going to go perform them. And you're going to try to figure out who you are on stage. And you're going to play with these professional people and go. Be good. Be great. Uh, I had it in me to do it, to be like, okay, here we go. And to try my best. But it takes time to get to know yourself on stage. And that doesn't mean like in a year you're going to have it. It means, holy shit, you got to do this a lot to really become comfortable, get to know your instrument, and really figure some shit out. Uh, the first time I performed with Vegas Nerve, um, we did okay. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea how to move or how what what I should do, how to sing live. Like I I uh, I didn't know any of it, and I blew my I didn't blow my voice. I got sick the first day and first rehearsal I was there, and I would wake up every day with no voice. This is all becoming too long, but. Uh, anyway, the, the first time I've performed with those, that was my third time on stage ever performing for anybody ever. Um, so it was terrifying. <laughs> and then you'll hear things from other band members, you know, like you need to move around more, man, fucking move around and like, you know, negative things like that. And you have no fucking idea what you're doing, you know? So, um, the, the next couple shows and stuff we did all right. Uh, everything I had built up in my head about, what performing live was supposed to be like or what all this kind of stuff got broken and shattered for the most part. Um, we would play to people that kind of didn't care. We'd play to like 10 people in an empty bar. And uh, it was very um, sobering to start learning about what the music scene is like outside of the dreams in your head. And that didn't completely go over well for me in, in a lot of ways too, considering all the other stuff that was happening. So um, anyway, you come back keep teaching, keep, keep living my life and trying to figure out how to make music. And I, I produced another record for myself and got a little bit better, started really incorporating mixed voice and things like that into it, but still had my issues and my problems. Um, it's hard to trace all this stuff. I did the other tour thing again. Every time I, I was on stage, I would warm up to the point of actually being on stage, plugging things in, mm -hmm, warming up, trying to don't, don't overdo it. Don't overdo it. And the second I would hit the first note, I would overdo it and I would just be slammed into my neck throughout the whole show, fucking just tearing myself up, not my voice, but just my body trying to push everything out of my head because I just didn't know what I was doing. So we'll expedite this a little bit because I, I wanted to mostly focus on talking about my voice and my voice history. Um, I produced about four or five albums or something. I did cover music. I did a lot of different things. And um, the, the relationship I was in, I was in a relationship for 17 years. Um, I always, I, I, I didn't really have a supportive anything when it came to music, like a relationship, like music was always a pain in the ass for the relationship. Everywhere we moved, I needed a space that was hard on the relationship. My dreams and trying to move forward towards them and having minimal success and everything was hard on the relationship. A lot of the stuff, when you have a dream like that, that you can't let go of, it's very difficult. Finally, um, set, like seven years ago, something like that, I decided to try to give up because I thought maybe that would help the relationship because of the resentment and jealousy and all the different things around it. And when I did that, I started to lose my singing voice. Um, what does that mean? It means that first, I, my range continued to go further down and further down. It became more and more difficult to hit higher notes. When I went to those higher notes, my voice would start to squeal and break. And this started around a C5, which was usually pretty simple um, in terms of mix and things like that. I noticed this, but I kept trying. Then I got to a point, like I said, where I started quitting music, but then I would still randomly sing in the car and I would notice things were getting worse and worse. Whereas I used to be able to mix and carry my voice over my bridge and do all these different things. Now it was much, much more difficult and it continued to get more difficult. As that time progressed and I kind of sort of tried to keep teaching, I sort of maybe tried to write something here or there, um, my speaking voice started to go as well. Every day I would wake up, my voice would hurt 
And if I talked a little bit more, a little bit more, my voice would start to go and get weaker and weaker and just hurt. When you start to lose your voice, you use other muscles to accommodate for the lack of chord closure, meaning you're, you're kind of having a break in the vocal cords. So then you have to go harder to get chord closure. And sometimes that means that you're kind of going like this and you're pushing things that shouldn't really be in there to uh, you know attain that chord closure i i make this kind of reference sometimes with somebody like steve-o from jackass the reason people end up talking like this is because they fuck their voice up so much that they're starting to use their false chords and and compression to get vocal cord closure because they otherwise can't get it regularly i was starting to have issues like that uh got out of my relationship moved to florida it was like three years ago Um, my voice started to get a little better and a little better and a little better. Along with my health issues, I recognized over, you know, much time, much time that certain things were causing my throat inflammation and making my life worse. So I had to continue to navigate that to eat cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and continue to, I continue to try to find exactly what my body wants and doesn't want because it will affect my voice. But I slowly started getting my voice back. I would do exercises almost every day, which were mostly just humming. And when you hear me do that now, that's so much more effortless. Back then it was, I could not get cord closure. So I continued to do that. And I knew when I moved down here, the imposter syndrome and all that kind of stuff, I need to join a band, can be a cover band, doesn't matter, but I need to do this stuff live. I can no longer be 35, 36, 37 years old and be this musician, this singer, professional singer that teaches and everything and really doesn't have his shit together when it comes to doing this stuff live. So I joined a band. Um, We had a drummer quit and then another drummer we fired. So we didn't get to do anything live for like a fucking year. But uh, every week I was rehearsing, 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 getting a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And there's so much to be learned from that. And one of the main things that's hopefully, if you're still with me, to take away from this, in that doing stuff live is so much more important than just the little I sang at my car, whatever, fuck. Um, You learn so much more about your voice and you start to enter into slowly or maybe quickly enter into stylistic or preference territory, meaning... You're going to keep pushing yourself up against walls, especially if you have to sing over your bridge all the time because you're met with a decision when you when you get there where do I go this way or this way? Do I push harder? Do I sink back? Do I go forward more? Do I distort? Do I compress? You're just met with these decisions. And after a while, you'll start to have preferences. Regardless of how the singer sings the song, you start to have preferences of like, I'm going to do it this way. I've done this so many times now, fuck it. I want to do it my way. The other way doesn't feel as good. The other way puts locks my muscles in my neck. And therein lies where a lot of this stuff really starts to blossom and you really start to come into your own. So I can't say enough. Get the fuck out of the car and the studio and the house and the thing and the shower and do this stuff live if you're really taking this seriously and do it a lot. Keep throwing yourself. You're going to have failures. You're going to squeak. You're going to crack. There's things that are going to happen. But getting to know and be comfortable on stage is going to just help tremendously because you just, it's part of this whole thing. And um, when you have to audition for a band or when you have to send a demo, that confidence that comes along with being like, I got this shit. It's not going to come in a month. And so many of these students too that I have, I've taught people from The Voice, from American Idol, shit like that. And then they go out on the road and they have no fucking idea what they're doing. And then they're like, how are you doing this high voice stuff? And and they expect to like get the information in one lesson, but then they're out singing all the time. That doesn't work. You cannot grab a piece of information and then just go and keep doing what you're doing on stage in that vulnerable, very, very vulnerable place and then just add that in. It has to happen behind the scenes. It's a very kind of slower progression. And one of the main takeaways, again, from me sitting here rambling on is how long does it take to get good? It fucking takes a long time. Um, What does it even mean to be good? Well, 
there's a lot of pieces to that. We don't have to go over all that. But again, a lot of it turns out to be style and preference. Some people have their style kind of laid out for them and they feel like that's, that's the thing. And maybe they grew up in the South. Maybe they grew up in New Orleans and they sing a little bit more bluesy and their father sang bluesy and that's what the way they sang. They're just making that decision. You don't have to, but that seems to be the style that was given to them that they're accepting that they're going with. And they hear other people singing other styles and they're like, nah, I'm going to sing like this. That's great, man. I didn't have that. I didn't grow up in a family with fucking accent or any kind of musical influence or whatever. My musical influences were mostly like Pink Floyd, Radiohead, Tool, these people that didn't necessarily have very distinctive voices that you could just instantly be like, that's who that is. But when you heard them a lot, you could start picking up, especially Tom York. I was very heavily influenced by Tom York um, from Radiohead. So anyway, moving forward, one of the main reasons I wanted to talk about this is because just recently, within the last couple months, I have entered into a place where I'm like, oh shit, I really am starting to have something special now where I can really drive my voice the way I want for a long time too. Uh, 15 or so years ago, I started putting up YouTube videos with a guy in Canada and he was like, dude, if I had a Ferrari for a voice like yours, I'd be driving that shit all the time. Nice compliment. I did not feel like I had a Ferrari. <laughs> um, I was like, maybe it sounds like that in recording and that's really nice of you, but no, I knew deep down, no. Now, at age 38, having performed, you know, on stage 50 times, maybe, something like that, maybe more, um, and going through all the shit I went through, ups and downs, and teaching myself, and teaching for 12 years, um, and knowing my shit, and learning how to do it, and, ah, and singing other people's songs, and singing my own songs, and writing my own records, and all that stuff, just now, as of a couple months ago, for whatever reason, because of the constant hitting the wall, and being up against it, and performing, and, and can you perform tomorrow for three hours? Yeah. Can you perform tomorrow for four hours? Yeah. Because of that now, I am starting to enter into the, your voice is a Ferrari. I know that's totally fucking goofy, and goobery, but actually feeling that way now and being like, oh, I I need to showcase this. I can actually do this. It's not some bullshitty Instagram, somebody fucking singing the playback, lip syncing bullshit. It's actually, I can fucking do this. And it took me a long time and it's probably going to take you a long time too. Um, if I have any advice throughout all of this, again, first of all, I cannot say enough throughout my entire life with panic disorder and pain and wanting to not exist and depression and all this stuff to be gentle on yourself in your journey. If you have something special like a guitar gift or a voice gift or something, and then that's taken away, um, it's so easy and it was probably so easy to beat up on yourself throughout the whole journey and the whole time and, and just all that stuff, man. I should be better. I should be this. I should fucking, I'm going to fuck my fucking voice today, all this stuff. And then to have it taken away resets your entire perspective where you're like, okay, I'm going to try to enjoy this more. I'm going to take what my voice has given me and I might push myself a little bit, but at certain times you're like, all right, I, I'm pretty good. I'm going to, when I started getting my voice back, for example, there was no distortion or screaming. I was just grateful, overwhelmingly grateful to be able to sing clean and start kind of singing again because I couldn't do that. So the gift was starting to come back a little bit and I was like, oh my God, thank God. You know, maybe I can't do that anymore, but at least I can do this. A uh, very good lesson and teacher, but again, it also is a lesson in gentleness and approaching yourself with uh, gentleness and a kind, warmer, softer heart. Um, so uh, again, uh, as I move forward now, what are the things that really connected the dots here recently that made me feel like I could really just get there once again it was it was live putting yourself up against that wall and really fucking doing it and it was it was now which I want to get more into as I teach favoring compression over distortion compression over distortion compression over distortion starting to learn about those distortional compressed spaces but then starting to find that the just going for the eh, that that sound and that grittiness in there was hindering my notes and my choices and my elasticity of stretching up to higher notes when I needed to, 
then just staying in that place and compressing instead, the distortion was kind of there and I was still in the same kind of space, but it wasn't as distortion heavy has helped tremendously. And uh, hope, I want to try to get people into that place. I want to try to teach people that. I want to try to you know help people find that. But um, it's definitely really helped me to find that. And uh, I'm finding as well, and I'll, I'll tap out here. I appreciate if you've hung out with me here and listened to this and if it was in any way, shape, or form interesting because I'm sure it was all over the place. But um, as I've done the distortional thing and the compression thing and all that kind of stuff, um, I'm finding more and more... so. When you're singing, you're going to find new areas and try to build enough of a foundation where you understand the way things are kind of supposed to work. And then you're going to go outside of that realm and you're going to find new things. And then you got to test to see if they f are kind of based on your foundation, if they're keeping you open, if they're keeping your throat open, if they're healthy. Is my voice hurting? Am I blowing my voice apart? I can't really tell. And you're going to keep teetering back and forth. As you find new areas to go in, like I said, check them against your foundation. But also, can I relax? If you're trying to play fast on guitar or fast with drums, it's very similar to being like like this with your fucking all of your arms. And then somebody would be like, okay, well, try to just relax your arms and use your wrist. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. I want to be like heavier and faster and whatever. And it's like, no, it, it ironically comes from learning how to use less. The voice is exactly the same. You learn how to do something and then you bear down and you do all these things and you compress into it. And then you're like, yeah, but it's fucking wearing me out and it's very tiring and it's, eh, it's all this. Then you try to remember how to relax into it. Keep doing that and always keep that in the back of your mind. You find a new place, watch some of your favorite singers do it. Are they, again, physically arrested, like where they're just fucking doing it like this? Or are they walking around? Are they, are, they, are they blowing their voice out? Are they tired on stage? Could they get through the next song after that, etc.? There's always going to be a version of relaxing a little bit more, going back in a heavier place a little bit more, relaxing and letting yourself move forward a little bit more. It's just, it's going to be something that's uh, going to make sense to you the more and more you do it. I appreciate you guys following me. I appreciate you uh, listening to this. I, I hope that you get some kind of uh, different versions of wisdom from it. Uh, again, I'll try to put up a lesson video tomorrow. I'm going to be putting up more and more things now, um, singing wise. Um, I started writing a little bit more. Um, my life has been very heavy and and dark lately, and uh, it's been very hard to get through, and it's been very hard to wake up and, and live. But um, I'm still here. I'm still doing it. Um, I, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I'll be putting up videos here again soon of, of me actually doing this shit because it's definitely more of an invaluable thing to recognize that if you're somebody learning from somebody, you want to see them do this stuff. You want to hear them do this stuff. And uh, that's not something you see enough of. Or it's fake. It's kind of faked. The internet is all very faked, airbrushed bullshit where it's, you know, it's a video of somebody singing, but you kind of can't tell if they are. And most of the singing things I see too in Instagram and everything, when people are like, oh, this is so amazing. It's fake, dude. It's not real. It's somebody trying to look sexy or whatever and, and pretend to sing to a playback most of the time you can tell because the recording is right here and you can hear every single thing and then the person's like doing this and trying to be sexy you know whatever and you're like dude that fucking recording is smashed up against your face like this you're not fucking doing it there in front of everybody with proper lighting and whatever that's not how people record we don't turn on a bunch of nice lights and have fucking background lights so that we can sit here and record a song so Quit fooling yourself. Anyway, everybody, I hope everybody's doing well. Be gentle on yourself, and I'll see you here soon.